So hey everybody, welcome to ARE Live. I'm Mark Tier, the founder of Black Spectacles, and today I'm joined by some special guests um, who are going to be uh, sharing some of their stories about how they pass the ARE. Um, we were just at A19 uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we heard from so many uh, of you guys about your successes and struggles when it comes to passing this test. Um, and so what we did is we actually uh, aggregated a lot of those comments um, and ideas and what we're going to do today is with our three panelists, we're basically going to have a conversation um, uh, where they're going to share their stories about uh, their strategies and insights and how they helped pass um, to help you uh, plan your course uh, uh, of uh, passing these tests. So, uh, so that's the plan for today. Um, at our next ARE Live broadcast, uh, we're going to be discussing practice management. We're going to do that exam uh, with Mike uh, Newman. We're actually going to make a mock exam, which will cover uh, the knowledge and skills relating to uh, some of the topics on that exam, like creating a team, ethics, standards of care, um, and a variety of other things um, that you're going to want to know about the practice management side of architecture. Um, so that's coming at our next session. A couple of updates to our products. So you may have heard that uh, Black Spectacles is the first ever NCARB approved test prep provider for all six of the ARE 5.0 divisions. Um, that approval includes all of our study materials, uh, the lectures, practice exams, and flashcards. Um, so um, you should know that uh, they gave us their sample of approval. Um, uh, another thing that we do is uh, we have a group coaching program. So if you're looking for support and some structure to help you, you know, stay the course uh, while studying, you can register for our group coaching program, which actually our July cohort, um, the registration for that closes at the end of today. Um, so we run uh, cohorts, about uh, five or six of them throughout the course of a year, so pretty much every other month. Um, so the, our July one, uh, that registration closes today. Um, as a side note, um, you're thinking about um, you know pursuing licensure and, and test prep and so forth. I always like to tell people if you'd like your boss to pay for your Black Spectacles membership, be sure to tell them about our firm licenses. Um, we have many young architects who tell their you know say something to their boss and then you know it turns out that they're actually interested in helping you get licensed, which is one of our questions today, actually. Um, but uh, uh, you know, that's certainly an option for, for many firms. And we actually have put something new together. So if you'd like to learn more about the differences between the individual subscription and the group subscription, um, we're actually having a webinar uh, on Thursday, June 27th at noon, uh, which we call our Black Spectacles um, product demonstration. Uh, and then on this uh, webinar, one of our account executives, I think this time it'll be AJ, uh, is going to walk you through sort of the differences between a firm subscription and an individual subscription. Um, and uh, I just dropped a uh, link uh, for, if you'd like to register for that in the chat box. Today, as we always do, we'll have a special discount on Black Spectacles individual memberships to share, uh, which I'll provide that coupon code at the end of the show. Now let's talk about our guests. Um, so as I previously mentioned, we have three special guests today, all of which recently passed the ARE, so these guys know what they're talking about. Um, our first panelist, uh, Michael, studied architecture at Georgia Tech uh, and then continued his studies at Yale for his master's. After graduating in 2015, he joined HOK in New York uh, to work on the new LaGuardia project, which is supposed to be complete in 2021. So he just completed his final exam on June 10th um, and will uh, be a licensed architect very soon. So congratulations, Michael. Thank you. How's it going, everybody? Next, we have Kelly, who's the co-owner of Atelier KS, uh, which is a residential design studio whose work is primarily based in San Francisco and the surrounding Bay Area. She graduated from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo in 2006 with a degree in architecture and finished all of her exams this month, month which is amazing. So congratulations to you as well, Kelly. Thank you very much. And finally, Tyler, uh, who's a licensed architect located in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, close to us here. Um, in his practice, uh, he works uh, with the healthcare practice group and has taken a non-traditional path to licensure, working with a broad range of design professionals from landscape architects, mechanical engineers, general contractors, and of course, many influential architects. Um, so welcome, Tyler. Hello. Uh, so I want to th uh, first. I just want to thank all of you guys for uh, taking some time out of your busy schedule to to be with us today, um, and uh, you know share your stories and on the path to licensure. This is always a really popular uh, episode because um, everybody wants to know what you did, and how you did it, uh, and it's a great way to learn uh, some some useful tips and how to do that. So Kelly, I'm going to start with you for our first question here. Um, 
we just, we heard from a lot of people. We heard various stories uh, about how an architecture firm supports you on your path to licensure. From uh, you know, if we've heard we heard both sides of the extremes. You know, my firm pays for my test, gives me a raise, gives me time off. To the other side, my firm could care less um, and isn't helping me at all. Um, now I know you have your own firm, so this d question is a little bit different for you. But as you think about um, supporting young architects, how are you? Uh, uh, let's say planning to support uh, folks uh, on their path to licensure at your firm. Yeah, so I think that it would have been great, you know, um, to be in a bigger environment, bigger firm, maybe where there was a lot more of a support structure for that. Um, uh -huh. And certainly, like when that, it's just me and a, a co-owner um, for our, our small studio. And uh, eventually down the line when we do uh, get employees in here, it would be great to um, offer that sort of structure, you know, having gone through it more of a, as a solo endeavor, um, you know, it would have been really nice to, to have more support structure. But I guess I can speak to the people out there that might work for smaller studios or might, you know, work for those studios that you mentioned that like, oh, you know, I don't care. Um, yeah. And so to have more of a self-directed approach to this whole thing. Um, mm -hmm. And it's and it's sort of difficult. Like it, you, you do have to to find people. You know, find the the resources and the extra support that you need. So a lot of times, you know, um, having been through uh, your undergrad, you know, a lot of people that might be going through this or maybe passed under the 4.0s or something like that. And so, you know, having at least people, even if they weren't within my um, my firm, to sort of draw on um, for questions and support was was very helpful, um, but you have to be a little bit more, you know, directed at, a, or self-directed at seeking those people out. Um, and then, you know, I guess the only thing, and this, this doesn't matter whether you're in a large firm or a small firm like mine, um, you know, the time management portion of this, uh, you know, is key. So if you go into the Aries without a, a pretty good plan of like, this is how, this is when I'm gonna sort of create time to study for this thing, and uh, this is how you know I how I'm going to go about it um, section by section. Without a plan, it's sort of unlikely that you can kind of uh, keep the pace and and keep taking those tests and finish in any reasonable time frame. So I guess it's just sort of um, looking for the people that you need to talk to um, to to get a little bit more feedback on the best ways to study and where to where to look for material. And then also, you know, having your eye calendar, whatever you want, and actually inputting these are the blocks of time that I've uh, allocated uh, for this. Um, I think without those two things, I probably wouldn't have uh, have made it through this because um, it's it's a lot. <laughs> yeah. So those are those are my two things. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, the idea here, uh, if you don't have a lot of support from your firm, you're going to be sort of in this self-directed mode where maybe the first step is to find people who can help. Um, so sometimes that's, you know, uh, colleagues, so the person you sit next to who just got licensed or your project manager um, uh, or maybe even a principal. Um, and then in addition to that, um, you want to build a schedule, uh, make a plan that will keep you on track, um, that you can sort of hold yourself accountable. Tyler, uh, when you think about uh, the resources at your firm and at you know in, in your work experience uh, what have you experienced about how your firm uh, support can su has supported you well the firm support for me was actually very critical to getting these tests done because I have worked in a lot of small offices throughout my career where it's it's hard to find the motivation where nobody that none of the coworkers around you are doing the exams or have any reason to do any of the exams and a lot of times in a small firm, there's not a whole lot of motivation for them to you, for you to become licensed because the principal of the firm is the only one that's ever going to sign the plan. Mm -hmm. So moving, I made a recent transition to a much larger firm, and that was, ended up being the, the biggest uh, kick in the rear end for me with getting these forward for a lot of reasons. One, they paid for all of your passing exams. Two, they provided all the training materials you could you could imagine as far as training books. Um, three, they actually provided us with a Black Spectacle subscription, which helped substantially. Um, and four, they actually paid for our time off to take the exams. So all that support just really gave me zero reason not to go through the process and not to pass the exams. So that was, for me, that really was probably the biggest help because I could have taken these exams five, eight years ago had I had the proper motivation or 
felt like I could put all the capital out to pay for $200 exams and hundreds of dollars in testing materials. So yeah. it really, for me, was a critical experience. That's interesting. Tyler, did that have anything to do with, uh, you mentioned making a change and moving from one firm to the next. That Just out of curiosity, did that, I don't know, did that, how did that factor into, or did it factor into your decision to move to this, this other firm? Yeah, actually, um, I relocated from Colorado to Wisconsin, and one of the large reasons was because of, I mean, I, w I was looking at multiple different states and multiple different firms, but yeah. one of the driving factors was professional, was trying to move forward in my professional career. I felt like that I'd been stuck in these smaller offices that weren't, you know, I mean, I maybe I should have had more motivation personally to, to get my license. But they're just when you go to work every day and there's zero advantage um, or zero motivation to go through that process, it just wasn't it wasn't very good for me. So my my kind of this uh, move from Colorado to Wisconsin was driven in large part by trying to take the next step in my career, which was for me passing all of the exams. That's interesting. Um, so in this case, the firm is sort of supporting you. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Your what did you say, professional path or something like that? Yeah, just my the professional progress because you can only I mean, in our industry, I guess at some level you can only go so far if you're not an architect, if you're not a licensed architect. Um, you'll never be able to open your own firm if you have that sort of motivation. Um, a lot of times in larger firms, it stymies your promotion. You can't necessarily go a lot further. Mm -hmm. um, so just. For me, it was that was the logical next step. I, I want to sign my own plans. I want to move forward. I want to grow professionally. Um, so without calling, being able to call myself an architect or have that ability, it, I was stuck. I had no, no more room for growth. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Michael, I wonder uh, what are your thoughts here on uh, how your firm supported you on the path to licensure? Yeah, I, I think I had um, many of those experiences. Uh, just without the working for a small firm before, <laughs> yeah. so this is this is uh, my first job, and um, my firm uh, pulled out all the stops. Uh, I mean, they they pay for fees and exams and time to take the test, and um, there's a lot of other colleagues around who are going through the same thing, um, and that really helped when. Uh, you know, you get motivated enough to actually dive in. Um, I think the big present or preventing factors for me were just uh, being really tired out from work. <laughs> yeah. But then when uh, things lightened up a little bit and I was able to talk to some colleagues about, oh, here's how you sign up with the state. And, oh, here's how you, um, you know, expense these things with the firm and, um, and it was really just about, you know, scheduling the test and um, signing up for some study resources. And then you press go on the videos and it just kind of starts flowing. So Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about um, that, uh, what you just mentioned, where you're, you know, you have a deadline, you're working, finishing some drawings or whatever. Um, and so you're working a lot of hours. It's hard to stay focused on anything other than sleep and, and work. Um, Tell me about your strategy uh, about you know looking for those gaps uh, in between uh, to, to figure yeah. out if, to to <laughs> serve plan. Yeah, I think um, sometimes it worked out and sometimes it didn't. Um, uh -huh. You know, these you know, work schedules can be unpredictable, and uh, you schedule the exam, and that's your motivating factor to get studying. I think a lot of it for me was about um, staying really dedicated. Or the weekend and blocking out, you know, you know, several weekends in a row um, that I could dedicate like both both days to studying, and certainly the weekend before saying saying no to work and <laughs> um, or other distractions to sort of get things done. Yeah, how did that go? That uh, uh, um, uh, saying no to work uh, when it was time to, you know, uh, when you're about to take a test. Yeah, I mean, they um, they understand the importance of, of these things as well. So um, when I say, you know, I have a test on Monday and we've got a deadline coming up as well, 
um, they're like, okay, um, I've got this in the calendar from a long time ago and we've talked about it and it's part of the work plan and maybe it helps that there's other people around that we can sort of, you know, shift around and still get the job done. Um, but it, it was nice that um, the bosses were also supportive. Yeah, I think um, even just thinking about our uh, our company here, right? I mean, um, and you think about any any organization, right? Uh, who's um, who's got a group of people who they're trying to you know uh, keep busy? Uh, they have to sort of plan that out in advance. So if you're if you give your managers a heads up and let them know when your tests are, then as you're saying, um, you know, Michael, you're you're able to sort of create that space for yourself by by getting in front of it. Um, so they know it weeks in advance. So yeah, Michael's going to be taking a test. So maybe you need a day or two here, um, so they can sort of plan for it in advance. It really helps, I think. Um, yeah, it did. Right. It, re it really worked out. Awesome. Uh, so let's go to the next one here. Um, and with this one, Tyler, I'm going to start with you. Um, PPD and PDD. These are the two beasts uh, that are in uh, ARE 5.0. Uh, I think they took. When I took it, it was nine tests. Now it's six. So I'm convinced that they sort of cram three tests into one uh, for PPD and PDD, uh, the same. Um, Tyler, how did you handle these these two tests? What was your strategy? So I took PPD and PDD last. So I passed the other four prior to taking these. Um, I just wanted to get those out of the way um, before I, what I thought, you know, this material really was the vast majority of my study time. So. I just made sure to take them last. I built some motivation by passing the other four. Um, but really for me, I, I only studied for two weeks for both of these, and I just put together a pretty condensed study pattern where at the very beginning of the process, I took a uh, practice exam through black spectacles to just analyze where I stood with the material. I spent typically Monday through Thursday all my evening time um, going through my study materials, which is typically just hardcover books. And then at the end of the week on Fridays, I would take another test exam to just evaluate where I've gone and where I'm still weak. And then just basically the weekends leaning in, because I always scheduled my exams on Mondays, uh, at least for these, just the weekend leading in, I just focused a lot of my time on these weak areas that have been identified largely through uh, the results of the practice exams. So I just really condensed it and tried not to spread it out and think too much about it and just hammer it home quickly. Yep. Um, so let's see if I got that right. Two weeks of studying for each test. Uh, you scheduled your exams for Mondays, uh, Monday through Thursday is when you sort of did your studying. And then did I get it right that uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday is when you did the tests, uh, practice exams? Yeah, so Monday and Thursday was just a, a was general study pattern, so I would just follow, yeah. so I, I used a particular book, and I just followed the pattern and the progression of the material through that book, uh -huh. Monday through Thursday, not focusing necessarily on any particular area other than just going through the progression. Yeah. And then Fridays, just at the end of the week, before the weekends, I would take another practice exam to see, again, how well I've um, taken on the new material and where I still stand with uh, my weaknesses. And the mm -hmm. weekends were tent tend to be focused on those weaknesses rather than following the general study plan. So it's during the week, general study, Friday, see where I stand, over the weekend, focus on weaknesses. That sounds really smart. Uh, Kelly, how about yourself? How did you handle uh, these two exams? What was your strategy? <laughs> strategy was a little bit different. Um, I guess, I, I don't know. There, so I did them in order. Um, I did it in order, and the first three uh, I had a blocked out, I think, month for, um, and month and a half sometimes just to sort of prepare for them. And that was fine for the first three, and I guess since I was in this sort of self-directed mode and didn't get a whole lot of feedback from people going through the 5.0 system, a lot more um, of people who had been through the 4.0 system, you know, I didn't realize, I guess I wasn't prepared for, you know, how intense these two are. <laughs> mm -hmm. I walked into PPD, and I think that was the, the only one that I failed. Um, I was like, oh, man, I need a, I need a better stu study plan for these. So um, I think, uh, like, allocating more space for them is important. But I will say, I guess, on, you know, in terms of the strategy and how much time you allot for, for these particular two, um, I think there's some flexibility that, that should be built in as well, because I'm one of the people 
people, and I think that there's people listening that might be in this situation too. I have a seven-year-old. There's mm -hmm. sort of things and commitments in life, the things that just, you know, I have a residential clients that just don't care that I'm taking the Aries or not, so there's not <laughs> going to be like, oh, yeah, that's coming up on Monday. We'll sort of lay off. You know, there's just right. none of that. And so I think it's to have, you know, that, that scheduled time, like this is when I'm going to, you know, put in the time for this. Um, but then also to be a little flexible and be like, okay, if it's taking a little bit longer to get through these um, or to get through the material, you know, you have a lot of life commitments going on, you know, not to beat yourself up over it too. Um, I will say that the Black Spectacles um, practice test, at least for me, approximated the, the testing experience fairly well. And I think it's really important to block out that full like four and a half hours or whatever it is to sit and take it all the way through instead of just sort of doing a little bit on the practice exams just to get a feel for the questions because part of it just feels a bit like an endurance test, you know. Yeah. Uh, part of it, you know, when you're sitting for it, I was like, well, what am I being tested on here, like the content or just my ability to pay attention for, you know, this long? <laughs> Right. Um, and it's and it really is both. And so just sort of conditioning yourself um, for the testing experience, like literally how long you're going to be sitting there, um, ended up being really important. And so that's why, at least for um, the Black Spectacles content, that was um, incredibly helpful. So, uh, and you can't really do that since I was, um, you know, working throughout the days and then I had, you know, a, a, a child to care for in the evenings. There was like these blocked out times after um, she went to bed or on the weekends that I needed to sort of um, make up lost time. And so the practices, uh, the weekends are the only time that you can really get that sort of block of time in. Um, so I guess if you're in a similar situation, like don't beat yourself up on them. These two tests are hard. You know, allow yourself the time that you need, um, and uh, go back to NCARB's handbook because they will say a percentage, like you know, this much percentage or this targeted percentage is going to be about these content areas. So, you know, allocate your study, um, your study time and efforts accordingly. So if there's like this section that you're getting like all bogged down in and it's really not a high percentage of um, what you're expecting in the testing experience, you know, you really have to allocate and be wise with your time. And I think that's the way I got through it with all the other commitments that were going on in life. Yeah, that's really good. I love uh, that kids and clients don't care you're taking the test. That's funny. Yeah, um, they don't. <laughs> Um, it's funny, I never actually thought about that difference. Um, I've always thought about the example that Michael mentioned, uh, but you're right. If you're running your own practice or, you know, and or you have uh, little kids running around, um, it is a different dynamic that you, and that makes a lot of sense that you'd build some flexibility with your time um, and schedule that time, you know, as far in advance as you can. Um, yeah. uh, Michael, how about you? Uh, talk about your strategy for these two exams. Uh, yeah, I, these exams were definitely um, an endurance race, as you said, Kelly. It's, <laughs> I remember I was uh, physically sore after uh, <laughs> exiting the PPD because I was hunched over for so long. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I I took them in order um, from you know front to back as well, and um, I wasn't sure to what to expect, so I just sort of kept the same strategy that um, I'd been doing all along. Um, and then allocated uh, an extra week um, because I <laughs> basically I saw that the Black Spectacles lectures were like 36 hours or something. So I was like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to need to give this one a little bit more time. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I, my process was generally um, go through some lectures and I like to uh, take notes. Um, it, like the, a big thing for me was um, getting back into the study mode as after not being in it for a few years, it's like, okay, I'll just, I'll treat this like college and mm -hmm. um, I'm going to a lecture and I'm going to take notes. And then um, from there, you know, take the practice exams, definitely took the full hours and isolated myself and concentrated. And um, <clears throat> yeah. And then I would go through and write down um, everything that I got wrong and, the black spectacles or the, the description um, explaining what you got wrong really, really helped. And then I would look the stuff up and um, yeah, the whole, I, I really enjoyed these exams actually because I learned a lot that I didn't know yeah. and um, through the, the lectures and then, you know, Googling stuff like, Oh, let's I'll dive into that a little bit more. Oh, like, Oh wow. Crazy. This is how an air conditioner works or like, <laughs> right. Uh, 
yeah. So. So it sounds like you took a similar, somewhat similar approach, maybe not regarding time, but a uh, similar type of approach as Tyler, where first you're sort of going through the basic material, taking notes, taking a test uh, as your second step, and then sort of discovering where there's some holes in sort of uh, in, your, in your knowledge and then going back and sort of uh, shoring those areas up. Um, and then did you, you, how long did you take uh, for, uh, you know, to study for these tests? Um, I think I left myself like five weeks. Um, five weeks. I, okay. I definitely ended up studying, you know, above forty hours or whatever they ask you at the end of the exam. But um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Uh, so seeing some, I mean, what's interesting always about this, as far as I'm concerned, is you know everyone's a little bit different. Everyone's got a little bit different situation. So some, just one, you know, one person. If you're talking to a colleague and you know, they tell you they want to take one one test every two days or something, or one test every three months. Uh, that doesn't sound right to you. It could just be because you know everyone's got a little bit of a different approach to this based on you know their own situations. So uh, you're ultimately searching for an approach that works uh, for you. Um, so one of the things we heard about was sort of you know memorizing uh, the questions and sort of versus learning the concepts. Um, uh, let's say, uh, I think Michael, I'll start with you on this one. Um, talk to me about, you know, your experience uh, through studying and going through the whole tests and, and sort of the difference uh, around learning the concepts versus memorizing the questions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, it seemed to be that the entire exam um, is sort of order, organized around learning the concepts. It's, I mean, it's so much material and I maybe this was communicated in the lectures, but it's, it's kind of a, we're going to deal with all these crazy problems in our careers and it's about being able to know enough to figure it out um, and apply it across the field. So um, it, it, it was definitely about uh, learning the concepts and um, going through those exams, I was able to figure out which concepts I wasn't getting and then mm -hmm. really, you know, dive in and do more research on them so that I could figure it out. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Tyler, what are your thoughts on, on the, sort of the difference between these two things and, and what's more important? Well, yeah, and I agree. It, I mean, the, the general idea of what they're doing here is they're just, they want to know that you have a general understanding of the key concepts. And spending too much time on any particular one piece of subject matter is just detrimental because you may find that you only get one question or zero questions on that because it's also somewhat random what version of the test you're going to get and how what percentage of each one of those uh, concepts they're actually going to give you questions on. So for example, the, the, probably the, the best piece of advice I could give you about this is a situation that I ran into that the first time I took PPD, I failed it. And when I took it the first time, there was this particular type of structural question that I saw probably eight times. And it used a diagram that I'd never seen before. So throughout, throughout all these questions, it was, it was key to be able to understand what this diagram was in order to give it the right answer. And I just, for whatever reason, had never seen this diagram, didn't know anything about it. So when I went and studied the second time around for the exam, I spent a lot of time researching, understanding, and getting the concepts behind these particular structural diagrams that I saw. But when I went in the second time and took the test, I didn't see a single question that had that same diagram. So here I was thinking that this, that this particular exam is really high on this particular structural subject that uses this very specific diagram the first time around, but the second time around, it was nowhere even near the same the amount of questions on that particular subject. So I think if you try to focus too much on the specifics of the subject matter, it, you just it may just be lucky or unlucky that that's even covered on your exam that you get. So mm -hmm. it's, again, it's just more try to just focus on generally do I understand the concepts that they're going at because it's just impossible to know how much you're going to see that specific subject. Yeah, that's funny. It's making me remember um, uh, Jared, um, who runs the exam at NCARB. Um, he sort of stresses, like, the exam's just testing for minimum competency. It's not testing for, like, expert 
or super advanced <clears throat> knowledge. Uh, of course, we've always joked here at Black Spectacles that we were going to make t-shirts that we would pass out to people who passed all the tests, and the t-shirts would just say minimally competent, um, which we thought would be <laughs> really funny. Um, but uh, uh, in any case, I think it's important to sort of acknowledge that, you know, um, exactly that, that uh, um, I don't know, I guess there's a little bit of a danger there. I suppose that's sort of what we're getting toward here is that there's a little bit of danger when you study around, you know, getting into the weeds too deeply and just remembering that it, it is a, a, a higher level test um, around the basic concepts. And, and right here we, by the way, we say instead of memorizing the questions, I think we probably mean memorizing the facts. Um, and I think that's one of the keys when they've described you know, how they organize this exam, you know, maybe in ARE 4.0 and even earlier, it was a little bit more of a memorization type of exam where it was a good idea to kind of memorize the key facts, how many, you know, whatever it is, how many square feet in an acre, you know, blah, 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 little factoids like that. Um, whereas this is much more about applying sort of that knowledge at a higher level, at a more conceptual level um, uh, in most of the, you know, I think that's kind of like the lowest level of complexity that the, the test questions have. Um, which is a little bit different with ARE 5.0 than other exams. Um, Kelly, do you have any other comments here about this uh, sort of difference between the two? I do, um, and it's about kind of getting lost in the weeds um, of um, the specifics, but I often just thought back, I'm like, all right, well, what's the purpose that, you know, NCARB or, like, what, what, are they, what are they driving at? And a lot of times I think it's... Um, you're not expected to know everything about everything, but you're, you know, expected to make reasonable judgment calls in the design um, of these buildings and coordinate uh, with the people who know a lot more than you in some of these fields, right? So, you know, it wasn't when I was studying for the structural components, I'm like, well, what would it take to, you know, have reasonable conversations with my structural engineers about, you know, this, that, or the other and get the feedback that I need to um, to make certain calls on things, um, and so if you can get to a point where like yeah, I think I'd be prepared to have, you know, reasonable discussions with um, you know these members of my project team, then that's usually pretty good um, for uh, ARI 5.0 because they're going to be asking you a lot of those things like what would you do in this situation, um, and from what I hear, I never tested under 4.0 that it was sort of a little bit different how they um, they put those. Uh, they formulated those questions. Um, so when I got lost in the weeds, and everybody will, you kind of get into one specific area or the other, and be like, oh, I'm learning about acoustics, and you trail off, or I'm learning about, you know, uh, electrical systems, and you trail off, and, and I, particularly when you're trying to manage your own time, just being like, okay, what's, what's enough to um, understand the concepts and be able to communicate clearly in these areas, and then if you can get that far and feel pretty confident, then uh, it's probably time to schedule the test, you know? Yeah, that's a really good metric in a way <clears throat> um, to figure out if you know enough is, you know, can you have reasonably competent discussions? I was just thinking, uh, you know, in which you're not embarrassed to be having conversations with those architectural <laughs> consultants, um, then you're probably knowledgeable enough about this particular topic. That's a good tip. I like that a lot. Yeah, and actually in the, you know, in the, uh, the residential sector, like we're often having, uh, my partner and I, having these uh, specific, you know, conversations where like, oh, here's what we're thinking, and uh, we'd like to do this specific thing, and we might be talking to a cabinet maker, or one of our structural consultants, or whatever, mm -hmm. and you bounce ideas off them all the time, and they give you more directed feedback, and then you take that, and that goes into your next project, and your next uh, discussion with that next project team, and so you, you build on it. And so mm -hmm. I often, like, you know, I was uh, going through this test, but like, oh, okay, this is an interesting thing, and, like, what would it take to, to really feel that I understand the concept of how, um, on, a, on a broader level, these things are, 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 are thought about, um, mm -hmm. and, and that was really helpful. Yeah, and that could be a good transition point here, Kelly. Uh, when you think about the exam how, and your experience with it, how does it differ? So how does the exam differ from your real-life experience as an architect? Well, I mean, the exam, um, I mean, first off, uh, residential is just going to be different than a lot of these. Uh, the 5.0 is targeted on larger projects, um, mm -hmm. and so, you know, ADA doesn't really come in the same way. And so there's a lot of things that I just was uh, interested in, um, the differences between what I was doing, you know, in uh, residential work in San Francisco versus uh, what, you know, much lo what much larger firms might be thinking about. 
Mm -hmm. um, but it was helpful because I think, uh, you know, whatever your real life experience is, I think architects a lot of times um, they're going to work for, you know, one firm or um, maybe a shift firms every couple of years or whatever, but the, the culture inside that firm and what kind of project types they specialize, you kind of just get in these little niches where you don't have a lot of communication or a lot of exposure to maybe what other sectors of the industry are doing. So even if it's not, you know, what you're learning on the exam is not your your firm experience, I still think it's uh, it was useful, it was interesting, um, and it sort of broadens your perspective, your perspective on, um, on uh, how to think about these things at any level. So I think a lot of, um, when I hear people talk about like, oh, that's not what I do, and, you know, that's not how our contracts are written, or this is not, you know, I think that we do this better than what, you know, NCARB asks, or, yeah, I've, I've heard all these sorts of <laughs> pieces of feedback from people. I'm like, well, you know, I don't think that is really the point. I think the point is, um, you know, uh, taking more of a broad stance on uh, how NCARB wants you to think about that, and I think that it'll apply to whatever you're doing. Or maybe at least give you a counterpoint and be like, well, there's a reason that I think this works a little bit better in this firm than, you know, you know how I would answer the question in uh, NCARB format. And in the video lectures, Mike Newman um, was talking about that as, as well. There are certain points where, like, you know, in my practice, and we kind of do it this way, and it veers off a little bit. And I think that's a normal experience. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think it gets people out of, like, their own particular firm and, and project type and, and broadens you know, the way you're thinking about it a little bit. Yeah, that's an interesting point. And I think if you try to put yourself in the shoes of NCARB, you know, they're supposed to be coming up with a test that somehow uh, evaluates, you know, all these architects in the in the country, every, uh, you know, state's a little bit different, every firm's a little bit different. Um, geez, how do they come up with some way to assess all these people in all these different situations? And you know, I think when it comes down to it, they have to they have to make some calls and they have to say, well, we're going to focus on this type of building type and we're going to use these contracts and they have to sort of, you know, kind of um, kind of put a, a stake in the ground and say, this is what we're going to focus on. And it's important that everyone who's taken this test, I think, sort of knows like, okay, well, you know, I might not be working on those building types, but this exam was focused on that, or I might not be using those contracts, but this exam was focused on that and and that's okay. And you know, forget about what you you think about that building type or that those exam or those um, uh, those contracts. Um, you know, they're just the ones I got to deal with for this you know exam. So I'm just going to deal with them for now. Uh, Michael, I wonder uh, what your thoughts are here about how the you know the difference between uh, the real the exam versus the you know real life practice as an architect. Yeah, I thought um, my my process of studying was really um, complementary. Um, like it was great to learn about uh, so my project has a really complicated contract mm -hmm. um, but it's great to learn about how maybe a typical contract works and <laughs> um, the different relationships between the entities and how the procedure is supposed to go um, so I, I thought that studying really helped with um, just laying out what um, even if your firm doesn't totally do it like this. I think the studying process helped me realize like, oh, well, maybe this is how it should be done. And it's not just in a tradition that's passed down, but they're teaching us to do it like this to, to protect us from a certain liability, um, you know, financial or, you know, taking things on that we aren't responsible for. And um, that, was, that was really helpful. Um, and another part was the complimentary the other way where there was a lot of practices in the firm and working on this project that really showed up in the exams. Um, like, oh, this is how you quickly run through a crazy amount of information, identify, you know, one tag here that leads you here to lead you to an asterisk here to read something in the code or look something up in the spec um, and just, you know, quickly find this piece of information, extract it, and then figure out how to implement it. and you know, that's a lot of what I do in my regular job, and then mm -hmm. it sort of came easy on the test. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Ty um, Tyler, tell me a little bit about uh, your feelings here. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, obviously, I, I think a lot of people, when they talk about real life for exam versus the exams, they're talking about the contracts, which is something that from firm to firm, everybody's going to treat every situation a little bit different based on you know, their experience or what they've gone through. So it's always going to be a little bit different. 
But I think the, the general rule of thumb to keep in mind is that generally how in-car and especially the AIA contracts want you to practice really is, generally speaking, best practice for how you should you should run your practice. You know, will there be situations that are different or very, very specific? Yes, obviously. But but again, just sticking with the whole point that the rule of thumb is, is that what we're trying to learn here is generally how sure. you should how you should understand these concepts. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I, I've seen contracts a bazillion different ways. I've seen processes a bazillion different ways. I've seen, um, especially with the exams that might test you over, you know, detailing and, and documentation and, and drafting, I've seen things drawn multiple different ways. But generally speaking, the way that they're trying to test you is best practice. And the, yeah. and the real world is just taking best practice and modifying it for their specific needs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think actually uh, that's a good point, and and I think I think maybe as Michael had mentioned, you know, this idea of, um, hey, I'm going to go learn some stuff, which is going to be a little bit different than how I'm doing it in my practice, and if you have this sort of mindset of, um, you know, it's going to be pretty interesting. I'm glad that I get to go learn these things I haven't experienced before. Um, I feel like you hear folks who have that that experience, they tend to maybe do a little bit better on the tests because they're more open-minded about it versus I know I've heard folks before who are like, well, that's not how you do it. You know, this is how you do it. And they sort of, um, they go into these exams, I think, sort of with this, you know, maybe more sort of clouded perspective on on what's what's going on in the test. Um, And, I I mean, to your point, uh, you know, the... Uh, you know, delivery models and the contracts that they use and, and the things that they reference, um, uh, they're all, uh, you know, uh, how do you say this? I think um, uh, instructionally sound, in other words, um, and I'm probably not using the right language here, but I know that, in fact, we have the, uh, they have a giant um, study that they did in order to, uh, where they surveyed uh, many thousands of architects in order to figure out what the uh, the most prevalent and, and competent ways are to practice. Um, in fact, I was just talking to Jared at the uh, A19 conference, and he was explaining to me how they—they're uh, actually, you know, they're, you know, they do that. Um, um, they do that report every, you know, five to ten years. Uh, he said they're just at the front end of starting the next one, and that they're basically responsible for, you know, um, ensuring that the test that they're testing us on. Um, is actually relevant to practice, and so they have to do this massive study, and they have to be able to prove that the, the test is actually relevant, uh, which is really interesting because he was talking about how, you know, practice is changing and how, um, you know, delivery models are changing and so on and so forth, um, which, I don't know, I never thought I would find those sorts of things interesting, but it actually is really interesting because things really are, you know, things are changing in practice, and, uh, and so they have to uh, accommodate things accordingly. All right, cool. So thank you, guys. Um I think this is my favorite question. Um, all right, so you took a test. Uh, maybe you maybe you had a celebration ritual uh, for after each test. Maybe you had a giant blowout when you uh, passed all six of them. Uh, Tyler, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you here. Uh, tell me about your celebration uh, approach and ritual. Uh, so I I think my celebration from exam to exam was. Just knowing, <laughs> a it was submitting my reimbursement, so I was going to get paid back for the exam <laughs> from my firm. So that was nice. And b and b typically, I just tried to schedule the next exam right away because, you know, for me, passing the exam was great. Getting to the next exam is great, but the the whole prize here is getting through all the exams. So I tried not during the process. I tried not to get bogged down and just tried to use that momentum. I just passed an exam. I'm going to go straight home. I'm going to file my reimbursement so I get my money back and I'm going to schedule the next exam and I'm going to move forward. Um, I did fail one exam, so that was an interesting process for me. Um, I think it just kind of gave me a nice little wake-up call for how I was preparing. I didn't prepare well enough, so after I failed and I kind of hit that that bump in the momentum, I did take a, a small break to just mm-hmm. let my mind, uh, just kind of set my mind free, get my head off of it. I've been deep in the books for a period of time. So I just, I, I, when I failed an exam, I did use that as a, a way to take a breath when I needed it. Um, otherwise, at the end of the process, it was, I mostly just celebrated um, internally and with my, my immediate family. Otherwise, in the firm, when you've got, I mean, I've probably got 
80 people that are licensed around me, it, it was pretty anticlimactic at, at the office. Um, so just the end of the celebration was really just, it was just very emotional for me as a person and just kind of internally, but not a, not a lot of celebrating outside of that or big blowouts or anything. Okay, uh, fair enough. Kelly, how about you? Oh, yeah, I think it's absolutely worth a celebration when you pass one of them. It feels good, you know, you guys should have like a little, uh, <laughs> I was talking to one of my friends about it who uh, went through the licensing process and um, everybody's different, but they're like, there's like a, a ritual or something. But uh -huh. for me, it's just a pretty simple ritual. Just hang out with people that I love and have a cocktail. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I think if you get through PPD or PTD, PDD, you're kind of entitled to two cocktails. Um, and uh, even if you fail, that's a, a similar strategy, then you could probably use a cocktail as well. So that was my uh, celebration. And I called my mom because she's always excited for me. <laughs> <laughs> and then I and I put I put the books down, honestly, for um, a couple days after. Like, you definitely want to keep that momentum going. Um, like to get through the entire thing, it took me years. I about I started around you know July of last year, mm -hmm. and then, like I said, I wasn't kind of trying to condense it into this. Uh, I, I just knew that I couldn't with all the different obligations into six months. So I was like, let's be reasonable about it. Um, and so you know, it just depends on how how much you want to push it, but definitely the cocktail strategy I think is a good one. <laughs> I like the <laughs> cocktail strategy. The uh, cocktail Michael, strategy. How about you? Oh yeah, this is the best part. <laughs> um, I remember after the first one, um, you know, I had no idea what these things were going to be like, if they were going to be terrible, if I was going to pass. And then I was so relieved to pass the first one, uh, but also so stressed out. I just got myself like a huge milkshake and drank it in the park for like two hours. <laughs> so that was uh, awesome. that was great. But uh, the other ones. Um, Couple, a little bit less in the middle, you know, maybe some nice wine, and then I had a big blowout for the last one for sure. <laughs> what did you do? Tell me what you did. That's awesome. Um, yeah, I, I, um, I was made it my goal to like finish before my 30th birthday here, so then I oh, finished nice. right before, and then um, went out to like a lake house with a bunch of friends and enjoyed the weather and had a big party all weekend, so kind of celebrated both at once. That's awesome. That's a good way to do it. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> Very cool. Awesome. I always love this one. Um, all right, guys. Uh, this is, I, I still love, um, uh, I love, I would say milkshakes in the park and lake house party are pretty good. Call Mom's pretty good, too. Um, yeah, yeah. One of my favorites is, uh, I forgot who it was. I think it might have been Josh, Josh Mings, who um, bought himself uh, uh, some Legos after each, uh, uh, after each session, or after each That's session. That's unique. <laughs> Uh, maybe maybe he also took him to the lake house and made that part of their um, part of their uh, his his concluding party. But those are awesome, um, guys. Uh, you know, last thing here, uh, folks who are listening in, um, they're probably uh, either somewhat in the process or thinking about getting started. Um, uh, let's see, Kelly, I'll start with you. Um, any additional tips you have for folks out there who are wondering how to how to get these done? Yeah, um, I guess uh, my additional tip is more about like, um, I guess managing anxiety in the mm -hmm. actual testing experience. And um, I guess I had a strategy for actually sitting for each division and it didn't matter what the division was. And that's like, if I was going to feel a little panicky or anxious, it was going to uh -huh. probably be in the first 30 minutes when, uh -huh. you know, you're, there's a lot of questions to answer and you're like, you're just getting into it. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was probably going to feel a little panicky towards the end when you're watching the, the timer run out. Um, and so what I would do is always start with the discrete questions from, from the get-go um, and then, you know, wait out that 30, 40 minutes or, or, or so. Um, and then when I feel kind of calmer. I'm like, okay, I just sort of switch out of the discrete and then go to the case study because at that point I just felt like, okay, now I can look at all these, you know, all these pieces of information and a lot more content um, to sort of sift through. Um, so I would do that, and it, it, it kind of felt good because then you'd be like, all right, well, I got like maybe 30%, 40% of, you know, the, the discrete questions done, and then, you know, big block of time for case studies, and then, um, and then you know, towards the end, like switch back to follow up on, on the rest of the questions. And uh, 
you know, everybody, I think, you know, is going to feel a little bit of anxiety, and just like the, the, the actual being in those testing centers is not pleasant. I don't know if your testing experience is better than mine, but computers are awful, and the lights are awful, and just, you know, so you just have to, you know, know how your body's going to react to stress a little bit, and sort of uh, have, like, a strategy for when you're ready to look at one type of question versus another, and I felt that that was helpful. Yeah, that's a really good comment and, and something I'll, I've said before, I'll say uh, again here, uh, this anxiety bit is actually really common. There's a whole uh, line of sort of uh, inquiry around this and in, in, in academia around test anxiety. Um, so, I mean, everyone gets a little bit anxious and some people it's it's very anxious, some people it's overwhelmingly anxious, so it sort of runs the gamut. So regardless of, you know, regardless of whatever category you fit into, um, or someone fits into, I think the key here is to sort of be aware of it and just know it's okay and develop a strategy for how to manage it is sort of the, I'm remembering some of the goofy things I used to do to manage my anxiety during the test. Um, and it would probably be a really funny uh, thing to, uh, you know, document all the goofy things that everyone does um, to manage their strategies or to manage their anxiety when they go into the test. Um, or even like, you know, to be lucky, right? The Like baseball players who have all these goofy rituals for how they, um, you know, they, uh, they have, you know, keep the good luck going. Um, I'm remembering having some of those. Um, Michael, how about you? Any additional uh, tips to add uh, for how to uh, knock this test out? Yeah, yeah. Um, I definitely did something similar. I, you know, would sit down and take a deep breath and sort of center myself before and then uh, get rolling. And um, I also definitely had an extra coffee before the test so that I could <laughs> keep this for four hours <laughs> yeah. um, but then uh, yeah during the test um, I, I used the flag pretty liberally liberally mm -hmm. um, I really love to just sort of like roll through if there's anything I wasn't positive I was not you know pretty positive I was right on I would flag it and um, get back to it on the second half um, not the second half like the last 30 minutes or something but <laughs> um, that uh, for internal test strategies and uh, other tips it was just the hardest part for me was really making the effort to start um, I think you know getting through the process of filing with the state getting just sort of just deciding to um, commit and sort of change your life around a little bit to give yourself a ton of time to study for these things that was the biggest part but Maybe it was just doing it. It was just deciding to, to schedule the stuff and uh, make it happen. That um, was the biggest hurdle for me. Was there something that, uh, I don't know, contributed to you finally committing? I'm sorry? Was there something specific? Um, did someone say something to you? Did a... Uh, I don't know, did a boss talk to you at a review and say, hey, you know, you really should get licensed, and that was the thing that, like, triggered your uh, your commitment to doing it? Like, what what triggered it for you? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I think um, definitely, you know, bosses mentioned it in the review, um, but it wasn't too much external pressure, really. It was, yeah. it was mostly getting to a point in... Um, the project or ma being able to manage um, my workload um, and other like life demands that um, I felt, okay, I'm comfortable with this. And now I really want to, you know, see the next thing on the horizon. And I really feel like I want to get this done before that. Um, that. That was probably the motive. And then, you know, track that back a year. And that was probably the motivating factor. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Uh, Tyler, how about you? Yeah, I completely agree with about when you finally get in and you're at the computer to just take a deep breath before you do anything and just get yourself centered, like like you just mentioned. Um, you know, you've, you've going through the check-in process sometimes can take a while, and it's just it, it just can be a process. So just getting into the computer, take a deep breath, relax, get your desk organized before you really get into the test is important. Um, couple other small tips about the actual test. Um, something I found that was helpful was as soon as I got into the test, I would go straight to the case studies and make note of the resources that are available for the case studies. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they give you code sections, um, 
but, but you may find that there will be resources in the case studies that will help you answer questions throughout the test. So I would always make a note of those, and then any time I came across a question um, that might have information uh, in those resources, I'd always flag it. Um, but try not to go back and forth. I don't think it's a good idea to go to a question and then go back to the case study and look for the information. It would be better to just keep note of questions that could use those resources. Um, so I, you know, maybe I got two, three, four questions out of each exam just by simply knowing that there's a resource that can provide the answer inside of the exam. Um, otherwise, outside of the exam, I just think that the best thing you can do is if you are struggling with any particular subject matter, to just ask questions at work. Um, your work experience is going to be the, the biggest thing that can strengthen any, any of these subjects that you don't understand. You know, whether it's reaching out to a mechanical engineer and see if he'll give you a few minutes to help explain what a heat pump is, or um, asking whoever may deal with the contracts at work to get, maybe they can throw you a couple hours worth of work editing a contract and you can, and they can maybe hold your hand in understanding some of that subject matter. Um, I just think that utilizing those practical resources that you have at your day job, assuming you have an architectural job, Will, will be the biggest thing that will help you get through anything that you're stuck on, any of that subject matter, because you will hit subject matter that just doesn't make sense. Um, and, you know, again, it, well, I think a lot of people will run into problems with mechanical concepts or structural concepts, and just a few-minute conversation with, with an, an engineer, they can maybe they can just lay it out in a visual manner that helps you understand, or they just give you a one-liner that, that just makes it all click. Um, I just think using those resources is, is a great advantage. Yeah, I think that's a... Uh, I don't think I did that a whole lot when I was taking the test many years ago, uh, but that's really great advice. I mean, I love that uh, comment earlier, I think, from Kelly about talking to your consultants um, or colleagues, and if you can have a reasonable conversation with them, you're probably pretty good. Um, I think it's a good kind of measure of um, of the level of competence that we're they're trying to sort of assess us on. So that's really helpful. Well, thank you guys. I think those are some really great tips um, to bring our session to a close. Um, so again, I'd like to thank Kelly, Tyler, and Michael uh, for sharing your stories. As Angela wrote in the question box here, congratulations to all of you guys. Um, it's really cool that you guys, that we were able to get uh, so many folks who recently passed. So congratulations as uh, as uh, uh, Angela says, hip hip hooray. <laughs> uh, good job guys. Um, and so, uh, just uh, to, in conclusion here at our next ARE Live podcast, as I mentioned last time, um, uh, we're going to focus on practice management test. Uh, I just posted a link uh, in the chat box uh, here in, in about uh, 60 seconds uh, for, where you can register for that. Um, you can just go down to where it says chat, and the link is there. You can also go to blackspectacles.com slash podcast to register to, to attend. Um, to learn more about our ARE exam prep curriculum, you can go to blackspectacles.com where you can learn um, and try out any of our free course videos. A number of the folks on the uh, on our um, uh, conversation today mentioned uh, some of the resources that we have, including the group coaching program, um, which you can you can register for as well. And if you like uh, for your boss to pay for your membership, please sure, be sure to visit blackspectacles.com slash firms to learn more about our firm memberships for firms of any size. Uh, for those of you who are ready to start preparing for the ARE right now, you can use coupon code HTP. 62519YT to get 15% discount off of your entire duration of your ARE exam prep membership. And then lastly, tomorrow we'll send you an email follow-up about today's live broadcast, so please let us know what you think uh, and share any suggestions that you may have. I promise we read every word that you write and use them to tune our next episodes. So thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.